Hello everybody and welcome to the second stream, the second live reading of the Count of Monte Cristo. Before we start, I want to give everybody a very quick summary. I was going to do it my, by myself, but I feel like just reading the plot summary from Wikipedia would be good enough. <laughs> I don't think I would do a better job. I was going to use it anyway to make sure I remember the names. But I'll just give you, I'll just read you this very quickly and I'll stop where we uh, left off uh, last time. By the way, if this is your first time watching this stream or this VOD, if you're watching the recording, this is not my typical stream. Uh, usually I just watch, not watch, I play video games and I have, there's more commentary involved. Um, giving the audience more of my thoughts, what I'm thinking, my opinions that nobody asked for, so on and so forth. But in this case, it's just going to be me reading. I might say something here and there about the story because I love this story a lot, but I'm going to try to not do that because this is a very long book and there's really not... <laughs> I don't want to make, make this take longer than it has to. <laughs> All right. Anyway, here's the summary. On the day in 1815, when Napoleon escapes from Elba, Edmund Dantes sails the Pharaon into Marseille after the death of the captain, Leclerc. The ship's owner, Morel, will make Dantes the next captain. On his deathbed, Leclerc charges Dantes to deliver a package to General Bartrand exiled with Napoleon, and a letter from Elba to a Bonapartist in Paris named Nor Nortier. Crewmate Danglars is jealous of Dante's rapid promotion. On the eve of Dante's wedding to his Catalan fiancée, Mercedes, Danglars meets Fernand Mon Mondego, Mercedes' cousin, and a rival for her affections. And the two hatch a plot to anonymously accused him of being a Bonapartist. They didn't know he had a letter, though. Uh, Don Glars had a suspicion, but they didn't know for sure. Um, Dante's neighbor, Caderousse, is present. He, too, is jealous of Dante's, but although he objects to the plot, he becomes too drunk to prevent it. Dante's is arrested, and the cowardly Caderousse stays silent. That is kind of where we left off. Uh, chapter 6 introduces Villefort, who, who is the deputy crown prosecutor in Marseille. He was in a party with a bunch of other people that were talking about politics and Villefort's uh, father, who was a Bonapartist. And he's very ashamed of that. And people, there are some people who, oh, they always bring it up again and again in his presence. And he, yeah. He wants to prove that he's not a Bonapartist. And if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, at the end of chapter six, he, he is called out of the party. Yeah, he, he is called, uh, I think he's he's told that they caught a Bonapartist, something or other. Anyway, let's get to reading. I want to at least get to chapter 10, <laughs> but we'll see. All right. Oh, I don't think we have any music playing. Give me a sec. We do, okay. It's just very quiet. <clears throat> Chapter 7, The Examination No sooner had Villefort left the saloon, salon than, than he assumed the grave air of a man who holds the balance of life and death in his hands. Now, in spite of the no nobility of his countenance, the command of which, like a finished actor, he had carefully studied before the glass, it was by no means easy for him to assume an air of judicial severity. 
except the recollection of the fine of the line of politics his father had adop adopted, and which might interfere, unless he acted with the greatest prudence, with his own career. Gerard de Villefort was, a ha was as happy as a man could be, already rich, already rich. He held a high official situation, though only twenty-seven. Though only twenty-seven, he was about to marry a young and charming woman whom he loved, not passion passionately, but recently, as became a deputy attorney of the king. And besides her personal attractions, which were very great. Mademoiselle de Saint Méran's family possessed considerable political influence, which they would, of course, exert in his favor. The dowry of his wife amounted to fifty thousand crowns, and he had, besides, the prospect of seeing her fortune increase to half a million at her father's death. These considerations naturally gave Villefort a feeling of such complete felicity that his mind was fairly dazzled in its con contemplation. At the door, at the door, he met the commissary of police who was waiting for him. The sight of this officer recalled Villefort from the third heaven to he to earth. He composed his face, as he had before described, and said, "I have read the letter, sir, and you have acted rightly in arresting this man. Now, inform me what you have discovered concerning him and the conspiracy." We know nothing as yet of the conspiracy, Monsieur. All the papers found have been sealed up and placed on your desk. The prisoner himself is named Edmond Dantes, mate on board the Three Master the Pharaon, trading in cotton with Alexandria and Smyrna, and belonging to Morel and Son of Marseille. Before he before uh, before he entered the merchant service, had he ever served in the Marines? Oh no, Monsieur. He is very young. How old? Nineteen or twenty at the most. At this moment, and as Villefort had arrived at the corner of the Rue de Conseil, a man who seemed to have been waiting for him approached. It was M. Morel. Ah, M. de M <laughs> Monsieur de Villefort cried he. I am delighted to see you. Some of your people have committed the strangest mistake. They have just arrested Edmond Dantes, mate of my vessel. I know it, Monsieur," replied Villefort. "I am now going to examine him." "Oh," said Morel, carried away by his friendship. "You do not know him, and I do. He is the most estimable, the most trustworthy creature in the world, and I will venture to say there is not a better seaman." Seaman, you <laughs> know the merchant service. Excuse me. Oh, Monsieur de Villefort, I beseech you, or beseech you, your indulgence, indulgence, in indulgence, indulgence for him. Sorry. Vie Villefort, as we have seen, belonged to the aristocratic party of Marseille, at Marseille, Morel to the plebeian. The first was a royalist. The other suspected of Bonapartism. Villefort looked disdainfully at Morel and replied coldly, "You are aware, Monsieur, that a man may be estimable and trustworthy in private life, and the best seaman in the merchant service, and yet be, politically speaking, a great criminal. Is it not true?" The magistrate laid emphasis on these words, and if he wished to apply them to the owner himself. As if he wished to apply them to the owner himself, while well, his uh, his eyes seemed to plunge into the heart of one who, interceding for another, had himself need of indulgence. Morel reddened, for his own conscience was not quite clear on politics. Besides, what Dantes had told him of his interview with the Grand Marshal, and what the Emperor had said to him, embarrassed him. He replied, however, in a tone. Of deep interest, I entreat you, Monsieur Morvillefort, be as you always are, kind and equitable, and give him back to us soon. This "give us" sounded revolutionary in the deputy's ears. Ah, ah, 
murmured to him. This Dante is then a member of some carbonary society that his protector thus employs the collective form. He was, if I rec recollect, arrested in a tavern in company with a great many others. Then he added, Monsieur, you may rest assured I shall perform my duty impartially, and if he be innocent, you shall not have appealed to me in vain. Should he, however, be guilty, in this present epoch, epoch, impunity would furnish a dangerous example, and I must do my duty. There's more, there's be a fault. As he had now arrived at the door of his own house, which adjoined the palais, the justice, he entered after having coldly saluted the ship owner, who stood as if petrified on the spot where Villefort had left him. The antechamber was full of police agents and gendarmes, in the midst of whom carefully watched but calm and smiling stood the prisoner. Villefort traversed the antechamber, cast a side glance at Dantes, and taking a packet which a gendarme offered him, disappeared, saying, Bring in the prisoner. Rapid as had been via false glance, and had served him except it had served to give him an idea of the man he was about to inter in interrogate. He had recognized intelligence in the high forehead, courage in the dark eye and bent brow, and frankness in the thick lips that showed a set of pearly teeth. Via false first impression was favorable, but he had been so often warned to mistrust first impulses that he had applied the maxim to the impression for getting the difference between the two works. He stifled. He stifled. Therefore, the feelings of compassion that were rising composed his features and sat down grim and somber at his desk. An instant after Dantes entered, an, an instant after Dantes entered, he was pale but calm and collected, and saluting his judge with easy politeness, looked, looked round for a seat, as if he had been in Monsieur Moret's salon. salon. It was then that he encountered for the first time Villefort's look, that look peculiar to the magistrate, who, while seeming to read the thoughts of others, betrays nothing of his own. Who and what are you? demanded Villefort, turning over a pile of papers containing information relative to the prisoner that a police agent had given him on his entry, and that, already, in an hour's time, had swelled to voluminous proportions, thanks to corrupt espionage of which the accused is always made the victim. My name is Edmond Dantes, replied the young man calmly. I am mate of the Pharaon, belonging to Messieurs Morel and Son. Your age? continued Villefort. Nineteen, returned Dantes. What were you doing at the moment you were arrested? I was at the festival of my marriage, monsieur, said the young, young man, his voice slightly tremulous. So great was the contrast between that happy moment and the painful ceremony he was now undergoing. So great was the contrast between the somber aspect of monsieur de Villefort and the radiant face of Mercedes. You were at the festival of your marriage, said the deputy, shuddering in spite of himself. Yes, monsieur, monsieur, I am on the point at, on the point of marrying a young girl I have been attached to for three years. Villefort, impassive as he was, was struck with this coincidence, and the tremulous voice of Dantes, surprised in the midst of his happiness, struck a sympathetic chord in his old is in his own bosom. He also was on the point of being married and he was summoned from his own happiness to destroy that of another. This philosophic reflection, thought he, will make a great sensation at Monsieur de saint Merlon's. And he arranged mentally, while Dantes awaited further questions, the antithesis by which orators, orators often create a, a reputation for eloquence. When this speech was arranged, Villefort turned to Dantes, 
his vehicle to his contest with it with his very shaggy beard go on sir said he what would you have me say give all the information in your power tell me on which point you desire information i will tell you all i know only added he with a smile i warn you i know very little have you served under you under the usurper i was about to be mustered into the royal marines when he fell it is reported your political opinions are extreme said Villefort, who had never heard anything of the kind was not was not sorry to him to make this inquiry as if it were an accusation my political opinions replied dantes alas sir i never had any opinions i am hardly 19 i know nothing i have no part to play if I obtain the situation I desire, I shall owe it to Monsieur Morel. Thus, all my opinions, I will not say public, but private, are confined to these three sentiments. I love my father, I respect Monsieur Morel, and I adore Mercedes. This, sir, is all I can tell you. And you see how uninteresting it is. As Dante spoke, Villefort gazed at his ingenious and open countenance and recollected the words of René, who, without knowing who the culprit was, had besought his indulgence for him. With the deputy's knowledge of crime and criminals, every word the young man uttered convinced him more and more of his innocence. This lad, for he was scarcely a lad, scarcely a lad, simple, natural, eloquent with the with that eloquence of the heart never found when sought for, full of affection for everybody because he was happy and because happiness renders even the wicked good, extended his affection even to his judge. Spite of Villefort's severe look and stern accent, Dante seemed full of kindness. Pardieu, said Villefort, he is a noble fellow. I hope I shall gain René's favor easily by obeying the first command she ever imposed on me. I shall have at least a pressure of the hand in public and a sweet kiss in private. Full of this idea, Villefort's face became so joyous that when he turned to Dantes, the latter, who had watched the change on his physiognomy, was smiling also. Sir, said Villefort. Have you any enemies, at least, that you know? Give me a sec. I have enemies, replied Dantes. My position is not sufficiently elevated for that. As for my disposition, that is, perhaps, somewhat too hasty. But I have, I have striven to repress it. I have had 10 or 12 sailors under me, and if you question them, they will tell you that they love and respect me, not as a father, for I am too young, but as an elder brother. But you may have excited jealousy. You're about to become a captain at 19, an elevated post. You're about to marry a pretty girl who loves you, and these two pieces of good fortune may have excited the envy of someone. You are right. You know men better than I do, and what you say may possibly be the case, I confess. But if such persons are among my acquaintances, I prefer not to know it, because then I should be forced to hate them. You are wrong. You should always strive to see clearly around you. You seem a worthy young man. I will depart from this, from this strict line of my duty to aid you in discovering the author of this accusation. Here is the paper. Do you know the writing? As he spoke, Villefort drew the letter from his pocket and presented it to Dantes. Dantes read it. A cloud passed over his brow as he said, No, monsieur, I do not know the writing, and yet it is tolerably plain. Whoever did it writes well. I am very fortunate, added he, looking gratefully at Villefort to be examined by such a man as you. For this envious person is a real enemy, and by the rapid glance to the young man's eye shot forth, Villefort saw how much energy lay hid beneath his 
beneath this mildness. Now, said the deputy, answer me frankly. Not as a prisoner to a judge, but as one man to another who takes an interest in him. What truth is there in the accusation contained in this anonymous letter? And Villefort threw disdainfully on his desk the letter Dantes had just given back to him. Not at all. I will tell you the, the real facts. I swear by my, by my honor as a sailor, by my love for Mercedes, by the life of my father. Speak, monsieur, said Villefort, then in, internally. If Rene could see me, I hope she would be satisfied. They would no longer call me a decapitator. Well, when we quitted Naples, Captain Leclerc was attacked with a brain fever. As we had no doctor on board and he was so anxious to arrive at Elba that he would not touch at any other port, his disorder rose to such a height that at the end of the third day, feeling he was dying, he called me to him. My dear Dantes, said he, swear to perform what I, I am going to tell you, for it is a matter of the deepest importance. I swear, Captain, replied I. Well, as after my death, the command devol devolves on you as mate. Assume the command and bear up for the island of Elba. Disembarked at Porto Ferraio. Ask for the Grand Marshal. Give him this letter. Perhaps they will give you another letter and charge you with a commission. You will accomplish what I was to have done and derive all the honor and profit from it. I will do it, Captain. But perhaps I shall not be admitted to the Grand Marshal's presence as easily as you expect. Here is a ring that will obtain audience of him and remove every difficulty, said the Captain. With these words, he gave me a ring. It was time two hours after he was delirious. The next day he died. And what did you do then? What I ought to have done, and what everyone would have done in my place. Everywhere the last requests of a dying man are sacred. But with a sealer, the last requests of, of his superior are commands. I sailed for the island of Elba, or I where I arrived the next day. I ordered everybody to remain on board and went on shore alone. As I had expected, I found some difficulty in obtaining access to the Grand Marshal, but I sent the ring I had received from the captain to him it was and was instantly admitted. He questioned me concerning Captain Leclerc's death and, as the latter had told me, gave me a letter to carry on to a person in Paris. I undertook it because it was what my captain had bade me do. I landed here, regulated the affairs of the vessel, and hastened to visit my aff affianced bride, whom I found more lovely than ever. Thank thanks to Monsieur Morel, all the forms were got over. In a word, I was, as I told you, at my marriage feast, and I should have been married in an hour, and tomorrow I intended to start to start for Paris. Had I not been arrested on this charge, which you as well as I know, which you as well as I now see to be unjust. Ah, said Villefort, seems to be the truth. If you have been culpable, it was imprudence, and this imprudence was in obedience to the orders of your captain. Give up this letter you have brought from Elba, and pass your word you will appear. You will appear should you be required, and go and rejoin your friends. I am free then, sir? cried Dantes joyfully. Yes, but first give me this letter. You have it already, for it was taken from me when with some others which I see in that packet. Stop a moment, said the deputy, as Dantes took his hat and, glo and gloves. To whom is it addressed? To Monsieur Nortier, Rue Coqueron, Paris. <laughs> mm -hmm. Had a thunderbolt fallen into the room, Villefort could not have been more stupefied. He sank into his seat and hastily turning over the packet, drew forth the fatal letter at which he glanced with a with an expression of terror. Monsieur Nortier, Rue Coqueron, number 13, murmured he, growing still paler. 
Yes, said Dantes. Do you know him? No, replied Villafort. A faithful servant of the king does not know conspirators. It is, con it is a conspiracy, then, asked Dantes, who, after believing himself free, now began to feel a tenfold alarm. I have, however, already told you, sir, I was entirely ignorant of the contents of the letter. Yes, but you knew the name of the person to whom it was addressed, said Villafort. I was forced to read the address to know to whom to give it. Have you shown this letter to anyone? asked Villafort, becoming still more paler. To no one, on my honor. Everybody is ignorant so that you are the bearer of, the, of a letter from the island of Elba and addressed to Muzi Nortier. Everybody, except the person who gave it to me. And that was too much. Far too much, murmured Villafort. Villafort's brow darkened more and more, his white lips and clenched teeth filled Dante's with apprehension. After reading the letter, Villafort covered his face with his hands. Oh, said Dantes timidly. What is the matter? Villafort made no answer, but raised his head at the expiration of a few seconds. And, and again perused the letter. And you say that you are ignorant of the contents of this letter? I give you my word of honor, sir, said Dantes. But what is the matter? You are ill. Shall I ring for assistance? Shall I call? No said Villafort, rising hastily. Stay where you are. It is for me to give orders here, and not you. Monsieur, replied Dantes proudly, it was only to assume assistance for you, to summon. I want none. It was a temporary indisposition. Attend to yourself. Answer me. Dantes waited, expecting a question, but in vain. Villafort fell back on his chair, passed his hand over his brow, moist with, per with perspiration and for the third time read the letter. Oh, if he knows the contents of this, murmured he, and that Nortier is the father of Villefort, I am lost. And he fixed his eyes upon Edmund as if he would have penetrated his thoughts. Oh, it is impossible to doubt it, cried he suddenly. In heaven's name, cried the unhappy young man. If you doubt me, question me. I will answer you. Villefort made a violent effort, and in a tone he strove to render firm. Sir, said he, I am no longer able, as I had hoped, to restore you immediately to liberty. Before doing so, I must consult the trial justice, but my own feeling is, you already know. Oh, monsieur, cried Dantes, you have been rather a friend than a judge. Spoilers. Well, I must detain you some time longer, but I will strive to make it as short as possible. The principal charge against you is this letter. And you see, Villefort approached the fire, cast it in, and waited until it was entirely consumed. You see, I destroyed it. Oh, ex exclaimed Dantes, you are goodness itself. Listen, continued Villefort. You can now have confidence in me after what I have done. Oh, command, I will obey. Listen, this is not a command, but advice I give you. Speak, and I will follow your advice. I shall detain you until this evening in the Palais de Justice. Should anyone else interrogate you, say to him what you have said to me. But do not breathe a word of this letter. I promise. It was Villefort who seemed to entreat, and the prisoner who reassured him. You see, continued he, glancing toward the gate, to the, toward the grate, where fragments of burnt paper flutter in the, in the flames. The letter is destroyed. You and I alone know of its existence. Should you, therefore, be questioned, deny all knowledge of it, deny it boldly, and you are saved. Be satisfied. I will deny it. It was the only it was the only letter you had? It was. Swear it. I swear it. Villefort rang. A police agent entered. Villefort whispered some words in his ear, to which the officer replied by a motion of his head. Follow him. 
said Villafort to Dantes. Dantes saluted Villafort and retired. Hardly had the door closed, and Villafort threw himself half fainting into a chair. Alas, alas, murmured he. If the procurer himself had been at Marseille, I should have been ruined. This accursed letter would have destroyed all my hopes. Oh, my father, must your past career always interfere with my successes? Suddenly, a light passed over his eyes, his face. A smile played around his set mouth, and his haggard eyes were fixed in thought. This will do, said he, and from this letter, which might have ruined me, I will make my fortune. Now to the work I have in hand, and after having assured himself that the prisoner was gone, the deputy procurer hastened to the house of his betrothed. Spoilers! <laughs> More spoilers! The Chateau d'If! The Castle of If! The commissary of police, as he tra uh, traversed the antechamber, made a sign to two gardeners. Gardeners. Gendarmes. I think it's gendarmes. Who placed themselves one on Dante's right and the other on his left. A door that communicated with the Palais de Justice was opened, and they went through a long range of gloomy corridors, whose appearance might have made even the boldest shudder. The Palais de Justice communicated with the, with the prison, a somber edifice that from its grated windows looks on the clock tower of the Aculus. Aculus? I don't know. After numberless windings, Dante saw a door with an iron wicket. wicket. The commissary took up an iron mallet and knocked thrice, every blow seeming to Dante as if struck on his heart. The door opened, the two gendarmes gently pushed him forward, and the door closed with a loud sound behind him. The air he inhaled was no longer pure, but thick and mephitic. He was in prison. He was conducted to a toler tolerably neat chamber, but grated and barred, and its appearance, therefore, did not greatly alarm him. Besides, the words of Eofort, who seemed to interest himself so much, resounded still in his ears, like a promise of freedom. It was four o'clock when Dantes was placed in this chamber. It was, as we have said, the first of March, and the prisoner was soon buried in darkness. The obscurity augmented the acuteness of his hearing. At the slightest sound, he arose and hastened to the door, convinced they were about to liberate him. But the sound died away, and Dantes sank again into his seat. At last, about ten o'clock, and just as Dantes began to despair, steps were heard in the corridor, a key turned in the lock, the bolts creaked, the massy oaken door flew open, and a flood of light from two torches pervaded the apartment. By the torch light, Dantes saw the glittering sabers and carbines of four gendarmes. He had advanced at first, but stopped at the sight of this display of force. Are you come to fetch me? Asked he. Yes, replied a gendarme. But the orders of the deputy procurer. I believe so. The conviction that they came from Monsieur de Villefort relieved old Dante's apprehensions. He advanced calmly and placed himself in the center of the es escort. A carriage waited at the door. The coachman was on the box, and a police officer sat beside him. Is this carriage for me? said Dante's. It is for you, replied a gendarme. Dantes was about to speak, but feeling himself urged forward and having neither the power nor the intention to resist, he mounted the steps and was in an instant seated inside between two gendarmes. The two others took their places opposite, and the carriage rolled heavily over the stones. The prisoner glanced at the windows. They were great, graded. He had changed his prison for another that was conveying him he knew not whither. Through the grating, however, Dante saw they were passing through the Rue, the Rue Caisseur and by the Rue Saint-Laurent and the Rue Tamaris, Tam, 
the Hamis <laughs> to the quay. Soon he saw the lights of the Consign. Consign? The carriage stopped. The officer descended, approached the guardhouse. A dozen soldiers came out and formed themselves in order. Dante saw the reflection of their muskets by the light of the lamps on the quay. Can all this force be summoned on my account? thought he. The officer opened the door, which was locked, and, without speaking a word, answered Dante's question, for he saw between the ranks of the soldiers a passage formed from the carriage to the port. The two gendarmes, who were opposite to him, descended first. Then he was ordered to alight, and the gendarmes on each side of him followed his example. They advanced towards a boat, which a custom house officer held by a chain near the quay. The soldiers looked at Dantes with an air of stupid curiosity. In an instant, he was placed in the stern sheets of the boat between the gendarmes, while the officer stationed himself at the bow. A shove sent the boat adrift, and four sturdy oarsmen impelled it rapidly towards the pillin. At a shout from the boat, the chain that closes the mouth of the port was lowered, and in a second they were there. And in a second they were, as Dantes knew, in the Friol, and outside the inner harbor. The prisoner's first feeling was of joy at, a, at, a game, at again breathing the pure air, for air is freedom. But he soon sighed, for he passed before La Reserve, where he had that morning been so happy. And now through the open windows came the laughter and revelry of a ball. Dantes fell, fell, uh, folded his hands, raised his eyes to heaven, and prayed fervently. The boat continued her voyage. They had passed the Tete de Mort. We're now off the Anse du Flore, Fajon, and about to double the battery. This maneuver was incomprehensible to Dantes. Whither are you taking me? asked he. You will soon know. But still, we are forbidden to give you any explanation. Dantes, trained and disciplined, knew that nothing would be more absurd than to question subordinates, who are forbidden to reply, and so he remained silent. I'm gonna take off my headphones. It's more comfortable this way. The most vague and wild thoughts passed through his mind. The boat they were in could not make a long voyage. There was no vessel at anchor outside the harbor. He thought, perhaps, they were going to leave him on some distant point. He was not bound, nor had they made any attempt to handcuff him. This seemed a good augury. Augury? I've never used that word, or nor heard it, nor read it. Besides, had not the deputy, who had been so kind to him, told him that provided he did not pronounce the dreaded name of Nortier, he had nothing to apprehend? Had not Villefort, in his presence, destroyed the fatal letter, the only proof against him? He waited silently, striving to pierce through the darkness. They had left the Al-Khatanou, where the lighthouse stood, on the right, and were now opposite the Point de Catalan. It seemed to the prisoner that he could distinguish a feminine form on the beach, for it was there Mercedes dwelt. How was it that a pres presentiment did not warn Mercedes that her lover was within 300 yards of her? When light alone was visible, and Dante saw that it came from Mercedes' chamber. Mercedes was the only one awake in the whole settlement. A loud cry could be heard by her, but pride re restrained him and he did not utter it. What would his guards think if they heard him shout like a madman? He remained silent, his eyes fixed upon the light. The boat went on, but the prisoner thought only of Mercedes. An intervening elevation of land hit the light. Dantes turned and perceived that they had not, they had got out to sea. While he had been absorbed in thought, they had shipped their oars and hoisted sail. The boat was now moving with the wind. In spite of his repugnance to address the guards, Dantes turned to the nearest gendarme and taking his hand. Comrade, said he, 
I adjure you, as a Christian and a soldier, to tell me where we are going. I am Captain Dantes, a loyal Frenchman. The thought accused of treason. Tell me where you are conducting me, and I promise you on my honor I will submit to my fate. The gendarme looked irresolutely at his companion, who returned for answer, a sign that said, I see no great harm in telling him now. And the gendarme replied, You are a native of Marseille, and a soldier, and a sailor, and yet you do not know where you are going? Oh my lord, I have no idea on my honor. Have you no idea whatever? None at all. That is impossible. I swear to you it is true. Tell me, I entreat. But my orders. Your orders do not forbid your telling me what I must know in ten minutes, in half an hour, or an hour. You see, I cannot escape, even if I intended. Unless you are blind or have never been outside the harbor, you must know. I do not. Look round you then. Dantes rose and looked forward, when he saw rise within a hundred yards of him the black and frowning rock on which stands the Chateau d'If, this gloomy fortress which has for more than hundred, three hundred years furnished food for so many wild legends, seemed to Dantes like a scaffold to a malefactor. The Chateau d'If? cried he. What are we going there for? The gendarme smiled. It's getting very cold in my room. Hmm. I need to, I need to raise the temperature. Holy. Holy crap. Holy crap, Lois. Um, <laughs> where was I? I'm not going there to be imprisoned, said Dantes. It is only used for political prisoners. I have not committed a crime. Are there any... Magistrates or judges at the Chateau d'If? There are only, said the gendarme, a governor, a garrison, turnkeys, and good thick walls. Come, come, do not look so, as so astonished, or you will make me think you are laughing at me in return for my good nature. Dantes pressed the gendarme's hand as though he would crush it. You think then, he said, that I am taken to the Chateau d'If to be imprisoned there? It is probable, for there is no occasion to squeeze so hard, without any inquiry, without any formality. Well, the formalities, all the formalities have been gone through. The inquiry is already made. And so, in spite of Monsieur de Villefort's promises, I do not know what Monsieur de Villefort promised you, said the gendarme. But I know we are taking you to the Chateau d'If. But what are you doing? Help! Comrades, help! By a rapid movement, which the gendarme's practiced eye had perceived, Dante sprang forward to precipitate himself into the sea. But four vigorous arms seized him as his feet quitted the bottom of the boat. He fell back, cursing with rage. Good, said the gendarme, placing his knee on his chest. This is the way you keep your word as a, as a sailor. Believed, believed soft-spoken gentleman again. Hark ye, my friend. I have disobeyed my first order, but I will not disobey the second. And if you move, I will blow your brains out. And he leveled his carbine at Dantes, who felt the muzzle against his temple. For a moment, the idea of struggling crossed his mind, and of so ending the unexpected evil that had overtaken him. But he bethought him of M Monsieur de Villefort's promise, and, besides, death in a boat from the hand of a gendarme seemed too terrible. He remained motionless, but na gnashing his teeth and wringing his hands with fury. At this moment, the boat came to a landing with a violent shock. One of the sailors leapt on shore. On shore, a cork, a cord creaked as it as it ran through a pulley, and Dantes guessed they were at the end of the voyage, and that they were mooring the boat. His guards, taking him from the from the arms by the arms and coat collar, uh, collar, forced him to rise and dragged him towards the steps that led to the gate of the fortress. While the police officer, <laughs> it's weird reading police officer. While the police officer carrying a musket with fixed bayonet bayonet followed behind. <clears throat> Dantes made no resistance. 
He was like a man in a dream. He saw soldiers drawing up on the embankment. He knew vaguely that he was ascending a flight of steps. He was conscious that he had passed through a door and that the door closed behind him. But all this indistinctly as though as through a mist. He did not even see the the ocean, that terrible the terrible barrier against freedom, which the prisoners look upon with utter despair. They halted for a minute, during which he strove to collect his thoughts. He looked around. He went as, he was in a court surrounded by high walls. He heard the measured tread of sentinels, and as they passed over the light he saw the barrels of their muskets shine. They waited upwards of ten minutes. Certain Dantes could not escape. The gendarmes released him. They seemed awaiting orders. The orders came. Where is the prisoner? said a voice. Here, replied the gendarmes. Let him follow me. I will take him to his cell. Go, said the, gen said the gendarmes, thrusting Dantes forward. The prisoner followed his guide, who led him into a room almost under un underground, whose bare and reeking walls seemed as though impregnated with tears. A lamp, a lamp placed on a stool illuminated the apartment uh, faintly and showed Dantes the features of his conductor and under jailer, ill-clothed and of sullen appearance. Here is your chamber for tonight, said he. It is late and the governor is asleep. Tomorrow, perhaps, he may change you. In the meantime, there is bread, water, and fresh straw, and that is all a prisoner can wish for. Good night. And before Dantes could open his mouth, before he had noticed where the jailer placed his bread or the water, before he had glanced towards the corner where the straw was, the jailer disappeared, taking with him the lamp and closing the door, leaving stamped upon the prisoner's mind the dim reflection of dripping walls of his dungeon. Dantes was alone in darkness and in silence, cold as the shadows that he felt breathe on his burning forehead. With the first dawn of day, the jailer returned with orders to leave Dantes where he was. He found the prisoner in the same position, as if fixed there, his eyes swollen with weeping. He had passed the night standing and without sleep. The jailer advanced. Dantes appeared not to perceive him. He touched them on the shoulder. Edmund started. Have you not slept? said the jailer. I do not know, replied Dantes. The jailer stared. Are you hungry? continued he. I do not know. Do you wish for anything? I wish to see the governor. The jailer shrugged his shoulders and left the chamber. Dantes followed him with his eyes and stretched forth his hand, hands towards the open door. But the door closed. All his emotion then burst forth. Oh, his emotion. He cast himself on the ground, weeping bitterly and asking himself what crime he had committed that he was thus punished. The day passed thus. Scarcely tasted food, but walked round and round the cell like a wild beast in its cage. One thought in particular tormented him, namely that during his journey, hither he had sat so still, whereas he might a dozen times have plunged into the sea, and, thanks to his powers of swimming, for which he was famous, have gained the shore, concealed himself until the arrival of a... Uh... Genus or Spanish vessel, escaped to Spain or Italy, where Mercedes and his father could have joined him. He had no fears as to how he should live. Good seamen, good seamen are welcome everywhere. He spoke Italian like a Tuscan, and Spanish like a Castilian. He would have been free and happy with Mercedes and his father, whereas he was now confined in the Chateau d'If, that impregnable fortress, ignorant of the future destiny of his father and Mercedes. And all this because he had trusted to Villefort's promise. The thought was mad maddening, and Dantes threw himself furious furiously down on his straw. The next morning, at the same hour, the jailer came again. Well, said the jailer, are you more reasonable today? Dantes made no reply. Come, cheer up. Is there anything I can do for you? I wish to see the governor. I have already told you it was impossible. Why so? 
because it is against prison rules, and prisoners must not even ask for it. What is allowed then? Better fare, if you pay for it, books, and leave to walk about. I do not want books. I am satisfied with my food. I do not care to walk about, but I wish to see the governor. If you worry me by repeating the same thing, I will not bring you any more to eat. Well then, said Edmund, if you do not, I shall die of hunger. That is all. The jailer saw by his tone he would be happy to die, and as every prisoner is worth ten sous a day to his jailer, he replied in a more subdued tone. You, what, what you ask is impossible. But if you are very well behaved, you will be allowed to walk about, and some day you will meet the governor. And if he chooses to reply, that is his affair. But, asked Dantes, how long shall I have to wait? Uh, a month? Six months? A year? It is too long a time. I wish to see him at once. Ah, said the jailer. Do not always brood over what is impossible, or you will be mad in a fortnight. You think so? Yes. We have an instance here. It was by always offering a million of francs to the governor for his liberty that an abbe became mad. Who was in this chamber before you? This is when they arrived. I guess so, yeah. How long has he left it? Two years. Was he liberated, liberated then? No. He was put in a dungeon. Listen, said Dantes. I am not an abbe. Abbe. I am not mad. Perhaps I shall be. But at present, unfortunately, I am not. I will make you another offer. What is that? I do not offer you a million, because I have it not. But I will give you a hundred crowns if... The first time you go to Marseille, you will seek out a young girl named Mercedes at the, Catel uh, at the Catalans and give her two lines from me. Catalans. Uh. If I took them and were detected, I should lose my place, which is worth 2,000 francs a year, so that I should be a great fool to run such a risk for 300. Well... Said Dantes. Mark this. If you refuse at least to tell Mercedes I am here, I will someday hide myself behind the door, and when you enter, I will dash you at your brains with this stool. Threats! cried the jailer, retreating and putting himself on the defense. You are certainly gone going mad. The abbe began like you, and in three days you will be like him. Mad enough to tie up. But, fortunately... There are, dungeon there are dungeons here. Dante's world is dual around his head. All right, all right, said the jailer. All right, since you will have it so, I will send word to the governor. Very well, returned Dante, dropping the stool and sitting on it as if it were in reality mad. As, he, as if he were in reality mad, yeah. The jailer went out and returned in an instant with, with a corporal and four soldiers. By the governor's orders, said he, conduct the Conduct the prisoner to the tier beneath. To the dungeon, then, said the corporal. Yes. We must put the mad, the mad man with the mad men. The soldiers seized Dantes, who followed passively. He descended fifteen steps, and the door of a dungeon was opened, and he was thrust in. The door closed, and Dantes advanced with outstretched hands until he touched the wall. He then sat down in the corner until his eyes became accustomed to the darkness. The jailer was right. Dantes wanted but little of being utterly mad. Wow. I love that chapter. A lot. <laughs> Alright. Chapter 9. The Evening of the Betrothal. Villefort had, as we have said, Hastened back to the to Madame de Saint Meran in the in the place du Grand Cour, and on entering the house, found that the guests whom he had left at table were taking coffee in the salon. Rene was, with all the rest of the company, anxiously anxiously awaiting him, and his entrance was followed by a general exclamation. "Well, 
Decapitator. Guardian of the States. Royalist. Brutus. What is the matter? Said one. Speak out. Are we threatened with a fresh reign of terror? Asked another. Has the Corsican ogre broken loose? Cried a third. Marquis, said Biafort, approaching his future mother-in-law, I request your pardon for thus, for thus leaving you. Will the Marquis honor me by a few moments' private conversation? Ah, it is really a serious matter then, asked the Marquis, remarking the cloud on Biafort's brow. So serious that I must take leave of you for a few days. So, added he, returning to Rene, judge for yourself if it not be... If it be not important. You're going to leave us? Cried Rene, unable to hide her emotion at this unexpected announcement. Alas, returned Villefort, I must. Where, then, are you going? Ask, uh, asked the Marquise. That, madame, is an official secret. But if you have any commissions for Paris, a friend of mine is going here, there tonight and will, and will with pleasure undertake them. The guests, uh, the guests looked at each other. You wish to speak to me alone, said the Marquise. Yes, let us go to the library, please. The Marquise took his arm and left the salon. Well, well, asked he as soon as they were by themselves. Tell me what it is. An affair of the greatest importance that demands my immediate presence in Paris. Now, excuse the indiscretion, Marquise, but have you any uh, landed... Landed property? Oh, my fortune is in the funds. Seven or eight hundred thousand francs. Then sell out. Sell out, Marquise, or you will lose it all. But how can I sell out here? You have a broker, have you not? Yes. Give me a letter to him. And tell him to sell out without an instant's delay. Perhaps even now I shall arrive too late. The deuce, you say, replied the Marquise. Let us lose no time then. And sitting down, he wrote a letter to his broker, order, ordering him to sell out at the market price. Now then, said, said Villefort, placing the, placing the letter in his pocketbook. I must have another. To whom? To the king. To the king? Yes. I do not write to his majesty. I do not ask you to write to his majesty, but ask, but ask Monsieur de Saville to do so. I want a letter that will enable me to reach the king's presence without all the formalities of demanding an audience. That, will, that would occasion a loss of precious time. But address yourself to the keeper of the seals. He has a right of entry at the Tuileries and can produce you audience at any hour of the day or night. Doubtless. But there is no occasion to divide the honors of my discovery with him. The keeper would leave me in the background and take all the glory for himself. I tell you, Marquise, my fortune is made if, on, if I only reach the Tuileries first, uh, the first, for the king will not forget the service I do him. In that case, go and get ready. I will call side of you and make him write the letter. Be as quick as possible. I must be on the road in a quarter of an hour. Yeah, I think it's inside trading. Tell your coachman to stop at the door. You will present my excuses to the Marquise and Mademoiselle René, who I'm le who I whom I leave on a, on such a day with great regret. You will find them both here and can make yourself farewells in person. A thousand thanks, and not for the letter. The Marquise rang. A servant entered. Say to the Comte de Saville that I would like to see him. Now, then, go," said the Marquise. I shall be gone only a few moments. Villefort hastily quitted the apartment, but reflecting that the sight of the deputy procureur running through the streets would be enough to throw the whole city into confusion, he resumed his ordinary pace. At his door, he perceived a figure in the shadow that seemed to wait for him. It was Mercedes, who, hearing no news of her lover, had come un unobserved to inquire about him. As Villefort drew near, she advanced and stooped before him. Dantes had spoken of Mercedes, and Villefort instantly recognized her. Her beauty and high bearing surprised him, and when she inquired what had become of her lover, it seemed to him that he was he was the judge, and he, that she was the judge, and he the accused. 
The young man you speak of, said Villefort abruptly, is a great camp criminal, and I can do nothing for him, mademoiselle. Mercedes burst into tears, and as Villefort strove to pass her, again addressed him. But at least tell me where he is, that I may know where he is alive or dead, whether he is alive or dead, said she. Here she is. I do not know. He is no longer in my hands, replied Villefort. And desirous of putting an end to the interview, he pushed by her and closed the door, as if to exclude the pain he felt. But remorse is not, is not thus banished. Like Virgil's wounded hero, the, he carried the arrow in his wound and arrived at the salon. Villefort uttered a sigh that was almost a sub and sank into a chair. Then the first pangs of an unending torture ceased, seized upon his art, heart. The man he sacrificed to his am ambition, that innocent victim immolated on the altar of his father's fault, appeared to him pale and threatening, leading his uh, affianced, affianced bride by the, by the hands and bringing with him remorse. Not such as the ancients figured, furious and terrible, but that slow and consuming agony whose pangs are intensified from hour to hour up to the very moment of death. Then he had a moment's hesitation. He had frequently called for capital punishment on criminals, and owing to his irresistible eloquence, they had been condemned. And yet, the slightest shadow of remorse had never clouded Villefort's brow, because they were guilty. At least, he believed so. He believed so. But here was an innocent man whose happiness he had destroyed. In this case, he was not the judge, the judge, but the executioner. As he thus reflected, he felt the sensation we have described, and which had hitherto been unknown to him, arise in his bosom and fill him with the vague apprehensions. It is thus that a wounded man trembles instinctively, instinctively at the approach of the finger to his wound until it be healed. But Villefort was one of those that never close, or if they do, only close to reopen, more agonizing than ever. If at this moment the sweet voice of René had sounded in his ears pleading for mercy, or the fair Mercedes had entered and said, In the name of, in the name of God, I conjure you to res restore me my affianced husband, his cold and trembling hands would have signed his release. But no voice broke the stillness of the chamber, and the door was opened only by Villefort's valet, who came to tell him that the traveling carriage was in readiness. Readiness. Villefort rose, or rather sprang from his chair, hastily opened one of the drawers of his desk, emptied all the gold, gold it contained into his pocket, stood motion, motionless an instant. His hand pressed to his head, muttered a few inarticulate sounds, and then, perceiving that his servant had placed his cloak on his shoulders, he sprang into the carriage, ordering the position post postillions to drive to Monsieur de saint Mirons. The hapless Dantes was doomed. As the Marquise had promised, Villefort found the Marquis. Oh, actually, Marquis and the Marquise. Marquis is for the man, Marquise is for uh, the woman. Let me put my headphones somewhere better. God, it's in the way. Uh, yeah. As the Marquis had promised, Villefort found the Marquise and René in waiting. He started when he saw René, for he fancied she was again about to plead for Dantes. Alas, her emotions were wholly personal. She was thinking only of Villefort's departure. She followed Villefort, and he left her at the moment he was about to become her husband. Villefort knew not when he should return, and René, far from pleading for Dantes, hated the man whose crime separated her from her lover. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Trying to guess who this is. Maybe that's Plan A and Villefort? But we haven't gotten into this. Meanwhile, what of Mercedes? She had met Fernand at the corner of the Rue de la, de la Loge. She had returned to the Catalans 
and had despairingly cast herself on her couch. Fernand, kneeling by her side, took her hand. Okay, that was Fernand and Mercedes. And covered it with kisses that Mercedes did not even feel. Fucking creep. She passed the night thus. The lamp went out for what for want of oil. But she paid no heed to the darkness, and dawn came. But she knew not that it was day. Grief had made her blind to all but one object. That was Edmund. Ha! Ah, you are there, said she at length, returning to turning towards Fernand. I have not quitted you since yesterday, returned Fernand sorrowfully. Monsieur Morel had not readily given up the fight. He had learned that Dantes had been taken to prison, and he had gone to all his friends and the influence influential persons of the city. But the report was already in circulation that Dantes was arrested as a Bonapartist agent, and as the most sanguine looked upon any attempt of Napoleon to remount the throne as impossible, he met with nothing but refusal, and had returned home in despair, declaring that the matter was serious and that nothing more could be done. Caderousse was equally restless and uneasy, but instead of seeking, like Monsieur Moret, to aid Dantes, he had shut himself up with two bottles of black courant brandy, brandy in the hope of drowning reflection. But he did not succeed and became too intoxicated to fetch any more drink, and yet not so intoxicated as to forget what had happened. With his elbows on the table, on the table he sat between the two empty bottles, while Spectre danced in the light of the unsnuffed candle. Spectres such as Hoffman strews over his punch drenched pages like black fantastic dust. Danglars alone was content and joyous. He had got rid of an enemy and made his own situation the Pharaon secure. Danglars was one of those men born with a pen behind the ear and an inkstand in the, in the place of a heart. Everything with him was multiplication or subtraction. The life of a man was to him of far less value than a numeral, especially when, by taking it away, he could increase the sum total of his own desires. He went to bed at his usual hour and slept in peace. Villefort, after having received Monsieur de Savio's letter, embraced René, kissed the Marquise's hand, and shaken that and shaken that of the Marquis, started for Paris along the A road. A road. <laughs> Old Dantes was dying with anxiety to know what had happened, what had become of Edmund. But we know very well what had become of Edmund. Hmm. Here we go. Let's see if we can get, go ahead, get through two more chapters before we reach the two hour mark. Chapter 10, The King's Closet at the Tuileries. We will leave Villefort at the road to Paris, traveling thanks to travel, travel fees with all speed and passing through two or three apartments. Enter at the Tuileries, the little, enter at the Tuileries, the little room, little room with the arched window, so well known as having been the favorite closet of Napoleon and Louis the <laughs> this is the 18th. Louis the 18th. And now of Louis Philippe. There, seated before a walnut table he had brought with him from Hart Hartwell, and to which, from one of those fancies not uncommon to great people, he was particularly attached. The king, Louis the 18th, was care carelessly listening to a man of 50 or 52 years of age, with gray hair, aristocratic bearing. An exceedingly gentlemanly attire, and meanwhile making a marginal note in, an, in a volume of Griffith's rather inaccurate but much sought-after edition of Horace, a work which was much indebted, indebted to the sagacious observations of the philosophical monarch. You say, sir," said the king, "that I am exceedingly disquieted, sir, sire. Really." Have you had any vision of the seven fat kind and the seven lean kind? No, sire, for that would only be, be, be token for us even seven years of plenty and seven years of scarcity. And with the king as full of foresight as your majesty, 
Scarcity is not a thing to be feared. Then, of what other scourge, scourge are you afraid, my dear Blackus? Blackus. <laughs> Sire, uh, I have every reason to believe that a storm is, is screwing in the south. Well, my dear Duke, replied Louis. I'm just going to call him Louis. I think you are wrongly informed and know positive positively that, on the contrary, it is very fine weather in that direction. Man of ability as he was, Louis liked a pleasant jest. Sire, continue, Monsieur de Blacas. If it only be to reassure a faithful servant, will your majesty send into Languedoc, Provence, and Dauphine? Trusting men who will bring you back a faithful report as to the feeling in these three provinces. Kanemusudis, replied the king, continuing the annotations in his horse. Sire, replied the courier, courier, laughing in order that he might seem to comprehend the quotation. Your Majesty may be perfectly right in relying on the good feeling of France, but I fear I am not altogether wrong in dreading some. Desperate attempt. By whom? By Bonaparte. Or at least by his adherents. My dear Blackus, said the king, you with your alarms prevent me from working, and you, sire, prevent me from sleeping with your security. Wait, my dear sir, wait a moment. For I have such a delightful tone note on the Pastor Cum Tahayet. Wait and I will listen to you afterwards. There was a brief pause during which Louis, yeah, Louis wrote in a hand as small as possible. Another note on the margin of his horse, and then looking at the Duke with the air of a man who thinks he has an idea of his own, while he is only commenting upon the idea of another said, go on, my dear Duke, go on, I listen. Sire, said Blackus, who had for a moment the hope of a of sacrificing Villefort for his own profit. I am compelled to tell you that these are not mere rumors destitute of foundation which thus disquiet me, but a serious-minded man deserving all my confidence and charged by me to watch over the south. Duke hesitated as he pronounced these words, has arrived by post to tell me that a great peril threatens the king, and so I hasten to you, sire. Mala ducis avi domum, continued Louis the 18th, still annotating. Does your sire wish me to drop the subject? By no means, my dear duke. But just stretch out your hand. Which? Whichever you please. There to the left. Here, sire. I tell you to the left, and you are looking to the right. I mean on my left. Yes, there. You will find yesterday's reports of the minister of police. But here is... Monsieur d'André himself, and Monsieur d'André, announced by the chamberlain in waiting, entered. Come in, said Louis, with, with repressed smile. Come in, Baron. Baron, and tell the Duke all you know, the latest news of Monsieur de Bonaparte. Do not conceal anything, however serious. Let us see, the island of Elba is a volcano, and we may expect to have issuing... Thence, issuing, I don't know, thence flaming and bristling war, Bella, Horida, Bella. Monsieur d'André leaned very respectfully on the back of a chair with his two hands and said, Has your majesty perused yesterday's report? Yes, yes. But tell the duke himself, who cannot find anything what the report contains, give him the particulars of what the usurper is doing in his islet. Monsieur, said the baron to the duke, all the servants of his majesty must approve of the latest intelligence which we have from the island of Elba. Bonaparte, Bonaparte, Monsieur d'André looked at Louis the Eighteenth, who, employed in writing a note, did not even raise his head. Bonaparte, continued the baron, is mortally worried and passes whole days in watching his miners at work at Puerto Lagon. And scratches himself for amusement, added the king. Scratches himself? Scratches himself, inquired the duke. What does your majesty mean? 
Yes, indeed, my dear Duke. Do you did you forget that this great man, this hero, this demigod, is attacked with a mal mal malady of the skin which worries him to death? Prodigo? And moreover, my dear Duke, continued the Minister of Police, we are almost assured that in a very short time the usurper will be insane. Insane. Raving mad. His head becomes weaker. Sometimes he weeps bitterly. Sometimes laughs boisterously. At other times he passes hours on the seashore, flinging stones in the water. And when the flint makes duck and break five or six times, he appears as delighted as if he had gained another Marengo or Austerlitz. Now, you must agree that these are indubitably symptoms of insanity. Or of wisdom, my dear Baron. Or of wisdom, said Louis the Eighteenth, laughing. Ha 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 ha. The greatest captains of antiquity amuse themselves by casting pebbles into the ocean. See Plutarch's life of Scipio Africanus. Monsieur de Blacas pondered deeply between the confident monarch and the truth truthful minister. Villefort, who did not choose to reveal the whole secret, lest another should reap all the benefit of the disclosure, had yet communicated enough to cause him the greatest uneasiness. Well, well, Dandre, said Louis the Eighteenth, Blackass is not yet convinced. Let us proceed. Therefore, to the usurper's conversion. The minister of police bowed. The usurper's conversion, murmured, murmured the duke looking at the king and Dandere, who spoke alternate, alternately like Virgil's shepherds. The usurper converted? Decidedly, my dear duke. In what way converted? The good principles. Two good principles. Tell him all about it, Baron. Why, this is the way of it, said the minister with the gravest air in the world. Napoleon lately had a review. And as two or three of his old veterans expressed this, a desire to return to France, he gave them their dismissal and exhorted them, exhorted them to serve the good king. These were his own words. Of that I am certain. Well, Blackass, what think you of this? inquired the king triumphantly and pausing for a moment from the voluminous scholiast before him. I say, sire... That the minister of police is greatly deceived, or I am, and as it is impossible it can be the minister of police, as he has the guardianship of the safety and honor of your majesty, it is probable that I am in error. However, sire, if I might advise, your majesty will interrogate the person of whom I spoke to you, and I will urge your majesty to do him this honor. Most willingly, duke. Under your auspices, I will receive any person you please, but you must not expect me to be too confiding. Baron, have you any reports more recent than this? Dated the 20th February, and this is the 3rd of March. No, sire, but I am, I am hourly expecting one. It may have arrived since I left my office. Go thither. And if there be none, well, well, continued Louis the, Louis the, the 18th. Make one. <laughs> that is the usual way, is it not? The king laughed. Fishiously. Fishiously. I don't know. Oh, sire, replied the minister. We have no occasion to invent any. Every day, our, every day our desks are loaded with more circumstantial denunciations coming from a host of people who hope for some return for services which they seek to render, but cannot. They trust to fortune and rely upon some unexpected events in some way to justify their predictions. Well, sire, go, said Louis the Eighteenth, and remember that I am waiting for you. I will but go and return, sire. I shall be back in ten minutes. And I, sire, said Monsieur de Blacas, will go and find my messenger. Wait, sire, wait, said Louis the Eighteenth. Really, Monsieur de Blacas, I must change your armorial bearings. I will give you an eagle with outstretched wings, holding in, in its claws a prey which tries in vain to escape and bearing this device, Tenax. That's him. I don't know, that's Andre. <laughs> Sire, I listen. 
said the Bacchus, biting his nails with impatience. I wish to consult you on this passage. Moli fugien anelilut, anelilut. You know, it refers to a stag flying from a wolf. But you're not a sportsman and a great wolf hunter. Well, then, what do you think of the Moli anelilut? Anelilut. Anelitu. The fuck? Admirable, sire. But my messenger is like the stag you refer to, for he has posted 220 leagues in scarcely three days. Which is undergoing great fatigue and anxiety, my dear duke. When we have a telegraph which transmits messages in three or four hours, and that without getting in the least of out and that without getting in the least out of breath. Ah, sire. You recompense but la badly this poor young man who has come so far and with so much ardor to give your majesty useful information, if only for the sake of Monsieur de Savieux, who recommends him to me. I entreat your majesty to receive him graciously. Monsieur de Savieux, my brother is Chamberlain? Yes, sire. He is at Marseille and writes me thence. Does he speak to you of this conspiracy? No, but strongly recommends Monsieur de Villefort and begs me to present him to your majesty. Monsieur de Villefort, cried the king. Is the messenger's, messenger's name Monsieur de Villefort? Yes, sire. And he comes from Marseille? In person. Why did you not mention his name at once? replied the king, betraying some uneasiness. He did. <laughs> he did, though. <laughs> Several times. Sire, I thought his name was unknown to your majesty. Oh, no. Oh, actually, he didn't mention the name. He thought about it, but he didn't mention it. No, no, Blackus. He is a man of strong and elevated understanding. Ambitious, too. And Pardieu! You know his father's name. His father? Yes. Nortier. Nortier de Girondin. Nortier the senator. He himself. And your majesty has employed the son of such a man. Blackus, my friend. You have, you have but limited comprehension. I told you Villefort was ambitious, and to attain this ambition, Villefort would sacrifice everything, even his father. Even his father. Then, Sire, I, may I present him? This instant, Duke. Where is he? Waiting below, in my, in my carriage. Seek him at once. I hasten to do so. The Duke left the royal presence with the speed of a young man. His really sincere royalism made him youthful again. Louis the Eighteenth remained alone, and turning his eyes on his half-opened Horace, muttered, Justum et denacem propositi virum. <laughs> Monsieur de Blacas uh, returned as speedily as, his, as he had departed, but in the antechamber he was forced to uh, appeal to the king's authority. Beaufort's dusty garb, his costume, costume, which was not of courtly cut, excited the Susceptibly, susceptibility of Monsieur de Bresse, Berze, who was all astonishment at finding that this young man had the audacity to enter before the king in such attire. The duke, however, overcame all difficulties with the word, his majesty's order, and in spite of the protestations which the master of ceremonies made for the honor of his office and principles, Villefort was introduced. The king was seated in the same place where the duke had left him. On opening the door, Villefort found himself facing him, and the young magistrate's first impulse was to pause. Come in. Come in, Monsieur de Villefort, said the king. Villefort bowed and advanced a few steps, waited until the king should interrogate him. Monsieur de Villefort, said Louis the Eighteenth. The Duc de Blacas, Blacas assures, as, assures me you have come. You have some interesting inter in information to communicate. Sire, the Duke is right. I believe your majesty will think it equally important. There he is. In the first place, and before anything else, Sire, is the news as bad in your opinion as I am asked to believe? Sire, I believe it to be most urgent, but I hope, by the speed I have used, that it is not irreparable. Speak as fully as you please, sir," said the king, who began to give away, give way to the emotion which had showed itself in Blackass's 
face and affect of Ilford's voice. Speak, sire. Sir, and pray begin at the beginning. I like order in everything. Sire, said Villefort, I will render a faithful report to your majesty, but I must entreat your forgiveness if my anxiety leads to some obscurity in my language. A glance at the king after this discreet and subtle exordium assured Villefort of the benignity, benignity of this august, august auditor, and he went on. Sire, I have come as rapidly to Paris as possible to inform your majesty that I have discovered in the exercise exercise of my duties not a commonplace and insignificant plot such as is every day got up in the lower ranks of the people and in the army, but an actual conspiracy. A storm which menaces not less than your majesty's throne. Sire, the usurper is arming three ships. He meditates some project, which, however mad, is yet perhaps terrible. At this moment, we will have left. El he will have left Elba, to go whither I know not, but surely to attempt a landing either uh, at Naples, or on the coast of Tuscany, or perhaps on the shores of France. Your Majesty is well aware that the sovereign of the island of Elba has maintained his re relations with Italy and France. I am, sire, sir," said the king, much agitated. And recently, we have had information that the Bonapartist clubs. Have had meetings in the Rue Saint Jacques, Saint Jacques. But proceed, I beg of you. How did you obtain these details, sire? They are the results of an examination which I have made of a man of Marseille, whom I have watched for some time and arrested on the day of my departure. Yeah, this person, a sailor of turbulent character and whom I suspect of Bonapartism, has been secretly to the island of Elba. There he saw the Grand Marshal. Who charged him with an oral message to a Bonapartist in Paris, whose name I could not extract from him. But this mission was to prepare men's minds for a return. It is the man who says this, sire. A return which will soon occur. A return which will soon occur. And where is this man? In prison, sire. And the matter seems serious to you? So serious, sire, that when the circumstance surprised me in the midst of a family's festival, on the very day of my betrothal, I left my bride in France, postponing everything, that I might hasten to lay at your majesty's feet the fears which imprisoned, impressed me, and the assurances of my devotion. True, said Louis XVIII. Was there not a marriage engagement between you and Mademoiselle de saint Meron, daughter of one of your majesty's most faithful servants? Yes. Yes. Well, let us talk about this plot, Monsieur de Villefort. Sire. I fear it is more than a plot. I fear it is a conspiracy. A, con a conspiracy in these times, said Louis the Eighteenth, smiling. It is a thing very easy to meditate, but more difficult to conduct to an end. Inasmuch as we established so recently on the throne of our ancestors, we have our eyes open at once upon the past, the present, and the future. For the last ten months, my ministers have redoubled their vigilance in order to watch the shore of the Mediterranean. If Bonaparte landed at Naples, the whole coalition would be on foot before he could even reach Piombino. If he lands in Tuscany, he will be in an unfriendly territory. If he lands in France, it must be with a handful of men, and the result of that is easily foretold. Execrated as he is, by the population. Take courage, sir, but at the same time rely on your on your royal gratitude. Our royal gratitude. Ah, here's Monsieur Dandre, cried Blackass. <laughs> Blackass. At this instant, the Minister of Police appeared at the door, pale, trembling, as if, and as if ready to faint. Villefort was about to retire, but Monsieur de, de Blackass, taking his hand, restrained him. The Corsican ogre. Oh, what? Oh, boy. At the sight of this agitation, Louis, uh, the, uh, Louis the 18th pushed from him violently the table at which he was sitting. What else, you baron? He exclaimed. exclaimed. You appear quite aghast. Has your uneasiness any, 
has your uneasiness anything to do with what Monsieur de Blackass has told me and Monsieur de Villefort has just confirmed? Monsieur de Blackass moved suddenly towards the Baron, but the fright of the courier pleaded for the... Sorry, I got a notification that distracted me. Uh, but the fright of the courier pleaded for the for forbearance of the statesman. And besides, as matters were, it was much more to his advantage that the perfect the prefect of police police should triumph over him than that he should humiliate the prefect. Sire, stammered the baron. Well, what is it? asked Louis. The minister of police giving away giving way to an impulse of despair was about to throw himself at the feet of Louis the eighteenth, who retreated a step and frowned. Will you speak? he said. Oh, sire, what a dreadful misfortune. I am indeed to be pitied. Pity. I can never forgive myself. Monsieur, said Louis the thirteenth, I, I, eighteenth, I command you to speak. Well, sire, the usurper left Elba on the 26th of, Fe of February and landed on the 1st of, of March. And where? In Italy? asked the king eagerly. In France, sire, at a small port near Antibes, Antibes in the Gulf of Juan. The usurper landed in France, near Antibes, in the Gulf of Juan. 250 leagues from Paris on the 1st of March, and you only acquired this information today, the 3rd of March. Well, sir, what you tell me is impossible. You must have received a false report, or you have gone mad. Alas, sire, it is but true. Louis made a gesture of indescribable anger and alarm, and then drew himself up as if this sudden blow had struck him at the same moment in heart and countenance. In France, he cried, the usurper in France. Then they did not watch over this man. Who knows? They were perhaps in league with him. Oh, sire, exclaimed the Duke de Blacas. Monsieur d'André is, is not a man to be accused of treason. Sire, we have all been blind, and the minister of police has shared the general blindness. That is all. But, said Villefort, and then suddenly checking himself, he was silent, then he continued. Your pardon, sire, he said, bowing. My zeal carried me away. Will your majesty deign to excuse, to excuse me? Speak, sire, speak boldly, replied Louis. You alone forewarned us of the evil. Now try and aid us with the remedy. Sire, said Villefort. The usurper is de detested in the south, and it seems to me that if he ventured into the south, it would be easy to raise Languedoc and Provence against him. Yes, assuredly, replied the, man the minister. He is advancing by a gap in Cisteron. Advancing. He is advancing, said Louis the Eighteenth. Is he then advancing on Paris? The minister of police ma maintained a silence which was equivalent, equivalent to complete avowal. And Daphine, sir, inquired the king of Villefort, do you think it possible to rouse that as well as Provence? Sire, I am sorry to tell your majesty a cruel fact, but the feeling in Daphine is quite the reverse of that in Provence and Languedoc. The mountaineers are Bonapartists, sire. Then, Robert Louis, he was well informed. And now my men, and now and how many men had he had he with him? I do not know, sire. Answered the minister of police. What do you know? Have you ne neglected to obtain information on that point? Of course it is of no consequence, he added with a withering smile. Sire, it was impossible to learn. The dispatch simply stated the fact of the landing and the route, route taken by the usurper. And how did this dispatch reach you? inquired the king. The minister bowed his head, and while a deep color overspread his cheeks, he stammered out, By the telegraph, sire. Is the 18, advanced a step and folded his arms over his chest as Napoleon would have done. <sighs> so then, he exclaimed, turning pale with anger, seven conjoined and allied armies overthrew that man. A miracle of heaven replaced me on the throne of my fathers after five and twenty years of ex exile. I have, during those five and twenty years, spared no pains to understand the people of France and the interests which were confided to me. And now, when I see the fruition of my wishes almost within reach, 
The power I hold in my hands bursts and shatters me to atoms. Sire, it is fatality, murmured the minister, feeling that the pressure of circumstances, however light a thing to destiny, was too much for any human strength to endure. This is probably the king again. What our enemies say of us is then true. We have learned nothing, forgotten nothing. If I were betrayed as he was, I would console myself. But to be in the midst of persons elevated by myself to places of honor, who ought to watch over me more carefully than over themselves, for my, for for my fortune is theirs. Before me, they were nothing. After me, they will be nothing and perish miserably from incapacity. Ineptitude! Oh, yes, sir, you are right. It is fatality. The minister quailed before this outburst of sarcasm. Monsieur de Bacas wiped the moisture from his brow. Villefort smiled within himself, for he felt his increased importance. To fall, continued King Louis, who at the first glance had sounded the abyss on which the monarchy hung suspended. To fall and learn of that fall by telegraph! Oh, I would rather mount the scaffold of my brother, Louis the Sixteenth, than thus descend the staircase at the Tuileries, driven away by ridicule. Ridicule, sire, why? You know not its power in France, and yet you ought to know it. Sire, sire, murmured, murmured the minister, for pity's approach, Monsieur de Villefort, resumed the king, addressing the young man who, motionless and breathless, was listening to a conversation on which depended the destiny of the kingdom. Approach and tell Monsieur that it, is that it is possible to know beforehand all that he has not known. Sire, it was really impossible to learn secrets which that man concealed from all the world. Really impossible, yes. That is a great word, sir. Unfortunately, there are great, there are great words as there are great men. I have measured them. Really impossible for a minister who has an office, agents, spies, and 1,500,000 francs for secret service money to know what is going on at 60 leagues from the coast of France. Well, then, see, here is a gentleman who had none of these resources at his disposal. A gentleman, only a simple magistrate, who learned more than you with all your police, and who would have saved my crown if, like you, he had the power of directing a telegraph. The look of the minister of police was turned with concentrated spite on Villefort, who bent his head in mod modest, modest triumph. I do not mean that for you, like us, continued Louis <laughs> for the 18th. For if you have discovered nothing, at least you have had the good sense to persevere, uh, persevere in your suspicions. Any other than yourself would have considered the disclosure of Monsieur de Villefort insignificant, or else dictated. My, by venal ambition. These words were an allusion, allusion to the sentiments which the minister of police had uttered with so much confidence an hour before. Villefort understood the king's intent. Any other person would, perhaps, have been overcome by such an intoxicating draught of praise, but he feared to make for himself a mortal enemy of the police minister, although he saw that Dandre was irre irrevocably lost. In fact, the minister, who, in the plenitude of his power, had been unable to unearth Napoleon's secret, might in despair at his own downfall interrogate Dantes, as so lay bare the motives of Villefort's plot. Realizing this, Villefort came to the rescue of the crestfallen minister instead of aiding to crush him. Sire, said Villefort, the suddenness of this event must, must prove to your majest majesty that the issue is in the hands of providence, that your majesty is Please your attribute to me as profound perspicacity and si as simply owing, owing to chance. And I have profited by that chance, like a good and devoted servant. That's all. Do not attribute to me more than I deserve, deserve sire, that your majesty may never have occasion to recall the first opinion you have been pleased to inform of me. The minister of police thanked the young man by an eloquent look and Villefort understood that he had succeeded in his design. That is to say, that without forfeiting the gratitude of the king, he made a friend of one of, of one on whom, in case of necessity, he might rely. 
Tis well, this is the king. And now, gentlemen, he continued, turning towards Monsieur de Blackass and the Minister of Police, I have no further occasion for you, and you may retire. What now remains to do is in the Department of the Minister of War. Fortunately, sire, said Monsieur de Blackass, we can rely on the army. Your Majesty knows how every report confirms their loyalty and attachment. Do not mention reports, Duke, to me, for I know how I know now what confidence to place in them. Yet, speaking of reports, Baron, what have you learned with regard to the re to the affair in the Rue de Saint Jacques? The affair in the Rue de Saint Jacques! Ex exclaimed Villefort, unable to repress an exclamation. Then, suddenly pausing, he added, "Your pardon, sire." But my devotion to your majesty has made me forget not the not the respect I have not the respect I have, for that is too deeply engraved in my heart, but the rules of etiquette. Go on, go on, sir, replied the king. Yet today earned the, the right to make inquiries here. Sire, interposed the minister of police. I came a moment, a moment ago to give your majesty fresh information which I have obtained on this head. When your majesty's attention was at attracted by the terrible event that has occurred in the gulf, and now these facts will cease to interest, interest your majesty. On the contrary, sir, on the contrary, said Louis XVIII, this affair seems to me, seems to me to have a decided connection with that which occupies our attention, and the death of General Gesnel will, perhaps, put us on the direct track of a great internal conspiracy. At the name of General Casnel, Villefort trembled. Every, everything points to the conclusion, sire, said the Minister of Police, that death was not the result of suicide, as we first believed, but of assassination. General Casnel, it appears, had just left a Bonapartist club when he disappeared. An unknown person had been with him that morning and made an appointment with him in the Rue saint jacques Unfortunately, the General's valet who, had, who was dressing his hair at the moment when the stranger entered, heard the street mentioned, but did not catch the number. As the police minister related this to the king, Villefort, who looked as if his very life hung on the speaker's, leap, speaker's lips, turned alternately red and pale. The king looked towards him. Yeah, it's getting pretty wordy. <laughs> too many names, too. Did you not think with me, Monsieur de Villefort, that General Jack Casnel, whom they believed attached to the usurper, but who was really entirely devoted to me, has perished the victim of a Bonapartist ambush? It is probable, sire, replied Villefort. But is this all that is known? They are on, on the track of the man who appointed the meeting with him. On his track? said Villefort. I don't quite remember this, but uh, something tells me that Villefort thinks that the person who made the meeting and maybe killed the man, may have been his father. I don't know. Yes, the servant has given his description. He is a man of, uh, he is a man of from 50 to 52 years of age, dark, with black eyes covered with shaggy eyebrows and a thick mustache. He was dressed in a blue frock coat, buttoned up to the chin and wore at his buttonhole the rosette of an officer of the Legion of Honor. Yesterday, a, a person exactly corresponding with this description was followed but he was lost sight of at the corner of the Rue de Gisienne and the Rue Coquerol. Villefort leaned on the back of an armchair. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's, that street sounds very familiar. Coquerol. Villefort leaned on the back of an armchair for as the minister of police went on speaking, he felt his legs bend under him. For when he learned that the unknown had escaped the vigilance of the agent who followed him, he breathed again. Continue to seek for this man, sir, said the king to the minister of police. For if, as I am all but convinced, General Kessner, who would have been so useful to us at this moment, has been murdered, his assassins, Bonapartists or not, shall be cruelly punished. It required all Villefort's coolness not to betray the terror with which this declar declaration, declaration of the king inspired him. How strange, continued the king with some asperity. Police think that they have disposed of the whole matter when they say murder has been committed, and especially so when they can add, and we are on the track. 
of the guilty persons. Sire, your majesty will, I trust, be amply satisfied at this on this point at least. We shall see. We no longer I will no longer detain you, Monsieur de Villefort, for you must be fatigued after so long a journey. Go and rest. Of course you stop at your father's. A feeling of faintness came over Villefort. Oh, you mentioned my father. Why? Why bring up my father? Look at this massive man. No, sire, he replied. I alighted at the Hotel de Madrid in the Rue de Tournon. Tournon. We have seen him. Sire, I went straight to the Duc de Blacas. But you will see him then? I think not, sire. Ah, I forgot. Say Louis, smiling in a manner which proved that all these questions were not made without a motive. I forgot you and Monsieur Nortier are not on the best terms possible. And that is another sacrifice made to the royal cause, and for which you should be recompensed. Sire, the kindness your majesty deigns to invince towards me is a recompense which so far surpasses my utmost ambition that I have nothing more to ask for. Never mind, sire, sir. We will not forget you. Make your mind ease. In the meanwhile... Alright. The king here detached the cross of the Legion of Honor, which he usually wore over his blue coat, with the cross of St. Louis, about the order of Notre Dame du Mont Carmel and St. La, la, la Sarre, la Sarre, la Sarre, and gave it to Villefort. <laughs> In the meanwhile, take this cross. Sire, said Villefort, your majesty mistakes. This is an officer's cross. Ma foi, said Louis XVIII. Take it. Such as it is, for I have not the time to procure you another. Bacchus, let it be your care to see that the brevet is made out and sent to Monsieur de Villefort. Villefort's eyes were filled with tears of joy and pride. He took the cross and kissed it. And now, he said, May I inquire what are the orders with which your majesty deigns to honor me? Take what rest you require, and remember that if you are not able to serve me here in Paris, you may be of the greatest service to me at Marseille. Sire replied Villefort, bowing. In an hour I shall have quitted Paris. Go, sir, said the king. And should I forget you, king's memories are short, do not be afraid to bring yourself to my recollection. Baron, send for the minister of war. Bacchus, remain. Ah, sir, said the minister of police to Villefort as they left the Tuileries. You enter my luck's door. Your fortune is made. Oh, by luck's door. Will be long first, Murder, muttered uh, Biafort, saluting the minister whose career was ended and <laughs> looking about him for a hackney coach. One pass at the moment, which he hailed, he gave his address to the driver, and springing in, threw himself on the seat and gave loose to dreams of admission. Ten minutes afterwards, Biafort reached his hotel, ordered horses to be ready in two hours, and asked to have his breakfast brought to him. He was about to begin his repast. When the sound of the bell rang sharp and loud, the, the ballet opened the door and Villefort heard someone speak his name. Is it his father? Who could know I was here already? Said the young man. The ballet entered. Well, said Villefort, what is it? Who rang? Who asked for me? A stranger who will not send in his name. A stranger who will not send in his, send in his name? How can he want with me? He wishes to speak with, speak to you. To me? Yes. Did he mention my name? Yes. What sort of person is he? Yes. Why, sir, a man of about 50. Short or tall? About your own height, sir. Dark or fair? Dark. Very dark. Your black eyes, black hair, black eyebrows. And how dressed? Asked Villefort quickly. In a blue frock coat, buttoned up close, decorated with the Legion, with the Legion of Honor. It is he, said Villefort, turning pale. Ah, uh, pardieu, said the individual whose description we had twice given, entering the door. What a great deal of ceremony. It is the custom in Marseille for sons to keep their fathers waiting in their anterooms. Oh, is it the custom? Yeah. Why did you keep, my, keep me waiting, son? Father, cried Villefort. Then I was not deceived. I felt sure it, was, it must be you. Well, then, if you felt sure, replied the, new, the newcomer putting his cane in a corner and his hat on a chair. Allow me to say, my dear Gerard, 
that it was not very filial of you to keep me waiting at the door. Leave us, your maid, said Villefort. The servant, the servant quitted the apartment with evident signs of astonishment. What a cliffhanger. What a cliffhanger. Chapter 12. Father and son, uh, I'm going to end the recording here. Uh, VOD viewers, thank you for listening to me read a book. You weirdos. Thank you. <laughs>